today is the um, 16th. Mm -hmm. Ready? Ready? Yes. All right, this is an interview with uh, Margaret Lear, December 16th, uh, 2002. It's a Monday, approximately 11 a.m. at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. The interviewer is Michael Russell. Um, could you tell me your full name, your date of birth, and place of birth, please? Yes, I'm Margaret Doris Alund Lear. I was born in Waterville, New York, and the date was September 21st, 1923. Okay, what kind of uh, schooling did you have prior to your military service? I went to Catholic Central High School and I majored in business, but I studied drama and art. And uh, I did a lot of public speaking and was in the various plays and things in school. Okay, um, now you enlisted, uh, why? well, first of all, I'd like to ask you, um, where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor and what was your reaction to that? Uh, I was in high school in Catholic High, and it was such a shock at the time to all of these seniors that everyone seemed to want to do something. What can we do? And I remember talking about it. And then uh, my brothers went into service, one in the Army and one in the Navy, and I was very close to my brothers. And uh, I, it was quite a loss without them at home. And that was when I saw pictures of women. And I thought, this is for me. I'm going. And my friend, a girl chum, was going to go with me. And we were to meet the next day. But I showed up and she didn't. But I signed up in Troy, New York. And I really felt that I wanted to do something. I worked in the telephone company, and I said, no, I, I want to leave, and I want to go in service. Mm -hmm. What branch of service and did you I went into the waves, mm -hmm. and they were new to the country, but that was for me. I was really excited about it, and my parents, of course, said, well, now a third one going, but we can't stop you, and I said, no. So uh, I had never been in a big city, and I had never been in Cohoes, New York, but I had my orders, and I went down to New York, and I was amazed at New York, and had to go to a center, and then they had to do all the health and everything, checkups and everything, came back home, and then they told me that I was leaving for the boot training at Hunter College, which is Lehman University today. Mm -hmm. And that was in the Bronx. So here was a little girl from a small town, what a elite going down on the various means of subways and so on and so forth to get around New York. But it was exciting. And I really felt that I was getting somewhere at that point. And Did then- Did you ever get homesick at all? Uh, I, uh, well, I will tell you that uh, as a little girl, Congressman McNulty's uh, grandmother lived in North Hoosick, and my mother used to let me go up there every year. So I was so used to being away that it came easy to me to be in service, and I would write letters and correspond. So uh, I, I just loved it. I loved every day of my military career. There was so much things that I was fortunate to be involved in and meeting people. When did you uh, enlist? I uh, enlisted in Troy, New York, and uh, that was uh, uh, the end, about the third week in March, but the active duty began April 6th. Of what year was that? Of 44. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, I had six weeks of boot training in Hunter, which uh, one of the things was the biggest thing was they, the day we arrived, we received all our clothing. 
And so the next morning at uh, 6, we had to get up and march to breakfast with our clothing. And marching was new, and the clothes was all new. We had cotton stockings because of the war. And to a, a woman that loved nylons, that was something different to wear these heavy cotton stockings, believe me and the short flat Oxfords, but we found out we needed the Oxfords because we were marching. We sang, they gave us the song sheet, and we had to learn the songs and sing on the way to breakfast. And then they informed us there, there's such a thing as captain's inspection. So uh, we girls had to learn how to have everything in the drawers a certain way and everything hanging a certain way. And in between times, we were so busy marching, learning. We had so much to learn. We never knew certain ships. We didn't know anything uh, about uh, link trainers and all these different things. So we had to learn as the men learned. We had all these things to learn about the Navy and the chain of command. And then we learned that uh, we no longer could decide what we were going to do. We were told what we were going to do for six weeks. So it was wonderful training. It was really good, and we shaped up, and I enjoyed that. And then uh, we had um, waiting for our billets, and we didn't know. Uh, we had a graduation ceremony in one of the large armories down there, huge. And uh, all I ever knew was the little armory at home, and you know, the small towns, but uh, never was in them or anything, so we marched. And it was very exciting, believe me, to swell with pride when you were marching and doing it right. It took six weeks to be perfect, but we were perfect. And then the other thing was the people in the Bronx would watch us marching, and they would be so excited to see these women learning how to conform. And then we had our shipping orders. We were all going various places. We had our picture taken all together, and we had a lot of uh, camaraderie with the girls all together. It was very, very good, and we did a lot of studying. We had to take tests and so on. But uh, I, I would like to say that I ran a switchboard in the telephone company, but I, I never had to do one in the Navy. And my first billet, they didn't know what to do with us. There were so many of us that had enlisted with our group. And my billet was Washington, D.C. And when we got to Washington, that was a shock. It was so beautiful. And uh, we were sent to Wave Quarters I, which was on the Potomac. And we could see the Jefferson Memorial, the Washington Memorial. It was just breathtaking. And the Potomac was beautiful. We had three airports that formed a V and the planes were going, all the military planes all the time. It was, believe me, for a, a, a sailor woman, it was inspiring at the time. And Wave Quarters, I, they said, well, we don't know yet what we're going to do with you. We're going to give, everyone serves a mess detail in the Navy. So for a little while until we get you a billet, we're going to give, a billet is where you're gonna work. We get you a billet, we're going to have you in ship's company and you'll have to do a mess detail. And um, I had never scrubbed floors and we had large, large mops and you had to squeeze the mops out and the floors were wooden in our mess hall. And we would feed 2,000 through a meal and they kept coming from all over, officers and enlisted as well. And then after, they, we would have to clean the floor every meal. And then we would have to line up the salt and pepper shakers. All these long tables had to be done with a string and they had to be perfect. And then the, the coffee urn, I had to do the coffee urn. And I had to climb up on the bar and get down into it with steel wool. And you had to keep going over it with your hands so that there was no nothing at all, no marks of the coffee. How large was this? And it was about that high. And uh, so here I'd be down in that, practically the head in it, and clean it. And all the square heads were the large pans that the food was in, and they had to be cleaned. So then the officer would come and check everything after. 
and they had to be clean, and we made sure they were clean. It was uh, kind of, uh, you wondered, you know, is this what I'm going to do? But you took it, you didn't complain, and we had to wear jeans, and I had never worn dungarees, but that was the Navy, you wore the shirts and the dungarees. And then I can remember one time, uh, quantities of food I never liked being near, and I had to pluck chickens. And I was so sick plucking chickens that I thought I was going to faint one time. And they said, well, we'll take you off the chickens. You're doing good on the cleaning. But we used to laugh. We'd go back to the barracks and say, look what we're doing, you know. <laughs> so, but it was interesting. But after the ship's company, they said, uh, you're going to be down at the Naval Air Station. You're going to paint maps. And they said, we understand you took art. I said, yes, yeah, I used an airbrush. And they said, but understand, uh, it's going to be secret. You cannot tell anyone what you're doing. You cannot tell your parents. You're not to talk about the work. You'll be there, but you won't talk to anyone and you'll be inspected every day. So we would carry our purses, we wouldn't take any junk in them or anything, and they inspected us as we went in and when we came out. And then we sat at long tables, and they had, you could see them in the room, whatever they made them with, they'd have these big white things, and then they would spray them green. And then we would see all these designs that we had to put the roads in, we had to put the pillboxes, we had to put the hills in. We had everything to do on these maps and we were painting them all the time and some of them with the airbrush and some with the little tiniest of brushes to paint everything in perfectly. And a steady hand was needed and that's what I had. I was able to do it and I enjoyed it, but you would see the other women doing it, but you didn't talk to them. You kept your mind on your work and you did that. They had large ones and small ones. Some of the large ones I had never seen until I watched the history program and I got so excited one day. I said, there's my map. And my husband said, you finally saw one. I said, yes. I said, that's what we were doing. But after the war, they told us that we could discuss the maps, that we had painted maps. So, uh, but it was kind of hard not being able to tell your parents what you did. And how, then, how many hours a day did you work on this? Oh, we worked all day. We would get in there at 8 in the morning, and then at 4 o'clock the bus would come, and then we would go outside, and then the inspection again, and then they'd take us back to the barracks again. It was very interesting. And uh, as I said, I did that for, oh, roughly, must have been four months of that. And then they said, uh, uh, we're going to have, there's, uh, you've been, Mrs. Allen, the commander, said, you've been chosen to go to Chicago. They're having the biggest bond drive of the war. And you'll be a representative of New York State. And I said, what do I have to do, sell bonds? She said, you'll do everything. You'll go, Commander Creedon will be your boss. Uh, you'll follow him around and you'll do whatever he wants you to do. And then you'll greet the people coming in. You'll hand out programs, familiarize yourself with the area so you can talk about it. They're going to show, they're going to sell bonds. They'll have all of the uh, radio, and tele or radio and movie people. There'll be all kinds of uh, admirals coming Everyone is coming to see the new equipment we're going to use in this war. And they said, you're going to see a lot of people. Well, I didn't realize I was going to see 500,000 people all in a group. And uh, it was all day long. But this was an honor. It was wonderful. They put us up in the Drake Hotel, which is a gorgeous hotel. They had given it over to the war effort. So uh, it was all military people, but it was beautiful. And we stayed there, but we met so many people there. I can remember uh, uh, Commander Creedon had uh, some kind of a ball uh, people that he, uh, baseball, he owned a group of people and he was quite famous. And uh, I met Gloria Vanderbilt's husband with him. His name was Pat DeChico at the time, he was a very interesting man. 
and we met so many people. And then uh, I saw Dorothy L'Amour, saw uh, uh, Red Skelton was wonderful, and uh, so many of them. I had the paper I brought with me. And uh, every day you met a movie star or somebody, and you would escort them down to the stage, and they would do their little bit, you know. It was very, very nice. And then the girls, uh, as I said, when we were through duty, we walked down Chicago. I remember seeing Marshall Fields' tree. One of the girls told me to meet her and we'll have lunch, but I didn't know they had seven cafeterias in the place, so you can imagine my feelings of trying to find her. A country girl lost, but it was a wonderful experience to meet all of these people. And I was right at home with them. They were so nice to me. Everybody was good to all of us. So it was rather exciting. And uh, when I came back uh, from the tour, I have pictures of the girls in the tour. When I came back, I, I was really exhilarated at the time. I thought it was so grand, and I don't know what I'm going to do now. And they said, well, we have a new job for you. You're going to Wave Quarters D. Well, I love Wave Quarters I. It was new, but D was an older one. And they said, you're going to be a chaplain's assistant. You can be a yeoman striker, which is a thing meaning you're going to be a yeoman when you stay. It takes a year to do it. And uh, Commander Fallon, Tom Fallon, was going to be my boss. And uh, he was a very nice Irish priest, very direct to the point when he wanted something. He'd say, get this off, and then I'd have to get a letter off to this person and that. He had been on a battleship, and he was very interesting. He told me all of the people that were on it when they were hit, and he said, uh, I brought a lot of rosaries with me, but he said, uh, I had so many that never had, they weren't Catholic and they all wanted rosaries. They, the fellows were really scared. He said, we were being bombed. So his ship was badly, his battleship was badly hurt. But he was the most interesting man and he was very dedicated. He could do everything for the thing he wanted. He started retreats and then uh, he brought uh, Fulton Sheen, Monsignor Sheen to come. And uh, I like to say, I have to say this, because Fulton Sheen was remarkable. When we, I, we arranged a retreat, and we had the lights off, and he came down, I escorted him down, and uh, when he got up there, he looked down at the audience, and he scared the daylights out of us. He said, where are you going? And he said it so loud, we, we all said, what did we do? But uh, he was a wonderful speaker, but the eyes that he had were very penetrating. And his speech was just wonderful. And he came several times just to come over to see us. And he was a remarkable man. If you didn't have some kind of faith, he'd give it to you. Because he'd make you feel that you better get to church once in a while or something. But uh, he was wonderful. And uh, every day in our uh, place, we had to have the flag ceremony. And I was part of ship's company. So we would have to go out and march. All of the people that worked in ship's company, we had a whole group of the waves, would have to go out and march out and raise the flag. And I think today, when people are beginning since 9-11 to see the flag and think of the country. They're getting the feeling that I had and many of us in service had. We all stopped. If you were on the street and all the cars around the communications annex where I worked, they all stopped until that flag got up. And it was something to look around and see this, cars and kids going to work and we ourselves were in it. It was very exciting, and then the flag, they'd get it raised, and then at 8 o'clock at night, it would come down. But I, to this day, when I see a parade, people look at me because I'm saluting. I, I feel so deep about the country and the flag. It means something. But uh, that, that was my work, and then I did a lot of uh, 
writing. I had to answer letters. There were girls going to be married. There were young men from the communication across the street. We had to get all their records so they could get married. And then the chaplain took me over to Bethesda Hospital. Bethesda is one of the biggest hospitals I've ever seen. It would make Albany Med look small. And it went on and on and on. I got lost one time, and he found me again. But I, if people want to see what war is, they should go in the hospital. Some men had no faces, some men had no legs, no arms. I saw so much. To this day, I still think about it. But uh, we, what the chaplain did, he said, uh, you'll notice the men are walking around with toilet paper. He said, everybody in the Navy that can walk does a job. It restores their dignity and lets them think they can do something. And I did. I'd see them all doing little things to keep busy. But uh, it was a wonderful experience to see these people. And I really knew what the war, I was only 20 years old. And uh, it, it was just grand to grow up like that and know what life was about. And I can remember uh, the chaplain said, you girls, he said, go out with all the young, good-looking fellows. But he said, how about taking some of these guys out? He said, they can go out. So we started going over, and we'd say, would you like to, we're going to go to lunch. Would you like to go? And then we'd take them. We'd get, cabs were cheap, 35 cents in Washington. We could go a whole zone. And we would, the boys would say, I'd love to go out. So we'd take them out. I have a picture of a young man that I took out, and he had only one leg. And I, my girlfriend was going with her boyfriend who had come home, and we went out and took this young man. And that was my last night in Washington. In fact, I called, I had been married the month before, and I called my husband and said, I'm going to take a young man out. He said, do it. So uh, he knew. I just felt that I should let my new husband know that I'm going out with someone. But uh, it was quite an experience to work for the chaplain and see all these things. And to me, to this day, I still feel that I would have gone now if my country needed me. I, I believe America is a wonderful country. And I've been to Europe, and I've seen people are not as fortunate to work like we could work and have the things we have. So I, I'm very dedicated to this country. And I think uh, I, oh, I have to tell you about my wedding. I had a plumber that used to come in and out, and he would fix things. And then if our typewriter went, he'd fix it. He could do anything. And when I was going to be married, uh, he said, I'd like to see you get married. And I said, yes. And uh, then I had uh, two women uh, uh, th that uh, were maids. And in Washington, the days of segregation, when you went down to 13th Street, they had barricades. You couldn't go over there. And uh, the two girls were so lovely to me that cleaned the office. And I get along with everybody. And they said, we're coming to your wedding. And those two girls came to my wedding. And they saved their money and bought me the most beautiful negligee I ever had in my married life. And then I had some of the Marine boys. The Protestant chaplain stood by me and the Catholic chaplain married me. So I had a, a very beautiful military wedding. And then when we went down to my wedding dinner, the gentleman came over and he said, how wonderful you and your husband are. You're so happy. He said, I'm the head of the Library of Congress. And he said, it's my pleasure to buy you all a drink. And he was so nice to us. So I met interesting people. I had uh, one of my things, uh, I babysat to get money. I made $62.50 a month, which wasn't much. And when you had to buy stockings and your lipstick and various things, uh, I said, well, I could use the money, so I babysat. And one of my 
gentleman that I babysat was uh, Colonel Byrne Lay, Jr. He wrote 12 o'clock high, and he said, I have uh, a manuscript here all typed. He said, though, when you come, if you want to read it, when you get through, let me know what you think. And uh, he said, I hope someday maybe I can get something for it. He said, publish it or have a movie or something. And he did have a movie. And I had his baby I took care of, and he was wonderful. And then I had uh, 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 Biddle, one of the Biddle family, I babysat for his child. And they were very, very well known, and he was on the embassy. So they, I met so many people that it was wonderful. And then I had the pleasure to be in the parade for Admiral Nimitz. Of course, I was one of hundreds of women, but I was in the parade. And I got the paper. I had the paper, the picture from the parade. And then I, uh, we took pictures all, you know, of the parade. One of my friends was designated to take the camera. So I brought the pictures, and I'd like to give them to you folks if you would like them. And uh, now, how, how long were you in the service? That from uh, April 6 uh, until 45 of October. My husband was discharged before me, what certain branch of service and was he doing? was in the army in the Signal Corps, mm -hmm. and uh, he. Uh, was discharged in September, and I was discharged in October, and I was going to go to Hawaii, but then I got married. So then, as long as my husband was out, it was embarrassing for him to be home, and his wife was still in, so I signed up and came home. But it was uh, the most wonderful time of my life, I thought, and I really enjoyed all of it. Did but, you ever uh, join any veterans organizations at all? Uh, I have the uh, um, uh, the uh, waves have their national group, mm -hmm. and I brought my cap. We have a cap. We wear caps, and uh, that's. I thought you should see the paper, the waves okay. uh, paper now that right. they have. We keep you, up. Have you ever uh, kept in contact with anyone that you served? Oh yes. I have. Uh, the girl that stood up for me in my wedding has come every year. And she liked horse racing. So uh, laugh if you will, but uh, uh, I liked it, but uh, I would be uh, working. And so I let her go with my husband every year. And then we got together when I retired. But uh, she still calls. She has called about two weeks ago. We keep up. And then other girls, we, I write, and we meet them at these conventions that the Waves National have. And it's very nice, and one of my officers I kept in contact with, and the chaplain. And then the chaplain, I had a letter from him. He died here in Saratoga, of all things. He came from Boston, but he was a missionary. And uh, he wrote to me after, and he said, well, I've had a couple of yeomen, but they can't spell. You're the only one that could spell. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, dear. But, uh, it, it was, uh, he took me to Annapolis, he took me to all kinds of places and meetings and everything and uh, met a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I'm a very fortunate woman. After the war, I was just as busy and I'm still busy involved with things. So uh, I uh, was always happy with people and uh, through the years I've done a lot of lecturing mm -hmm. for women women's place in unions. Did you ever uh, make use of the GI Bill? Uh, no, I was going to, but then uh, my husband did. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, I, I just said, well, all right, I'll be, I'll go back to the telephone company. And I went back to the telephone company and I worked and then my children came along. So then I didn't work for 16 years and I went back to the telephone company again and the company was different. They were going into computers. Mm -hmm. So then they said, well, I said, I feel like an antique. I've been in every kind of telephone company you've had. So I ran one of the first computers that they had, 52 buttons to learn how to do long distance on the computer, but I did that. And then they said, we'd like you uh, 
the people said, we'd like you to run to be a union representative. And I said, well, I don't know. They said, oh, you, you're going to do it. So I only lasted uh, a few months being a representative, and I went on the executive board of the union. So then I learned, I said, I might as well go back to school. So I went to Russell Sage in Cornell for a two-year program in labor management. I came out with all A's and B's and A's in economics, which was good at the time. So then uh, I uh, did a lot of lobbying in Washington, and I started meeting. Uh, uh, Jerry Solomon was going to run for office, and I was on the board of the League of Women Voters. So Jerry got acquainted, he and I, and I said, I, I, I like, I'm going to vote for you. And we stayed friends. All those years, I would call and say, I don't like this, what they're saying, or I like that. And Jerry was, I have his pictures, I have his family, pictures of all their, his daughter's wedding and everything. And he was a, a man's man, and he was a good person. So uh, I met him so many times. And then I remember Senator Jackson meeting him I met so many of them in Washington, and uh, I went to uh, seminars at Cornell, at Rutgers, Yale, learned a lot about unions. I was the two women who were in a class of 26 in, uh, down in Albany in the Russell Sage Cornell group, and the men at that time in the 70s were very insulting. A women's place was in the home, and a couple of them, uh, I remember a couple said, why don't you stay home with your children? And I said, no. I said, I'm going to work and I'm going to learn. And before I was through, all of the men all stood behind me and said that you, you did fine. You really, they really were nice to me. So I felt that once they knew me, it was great. I loved it. I loved the union work. And uh, when you, Kerry, was running, and I was non-political as far as saying who I would vote for, but they asked me, Marianne Krusevac asked me if I would help them. And I said, I'll speak. She said, will you speak on women's rights and women should vote? And I said, yes, I will. So I went around. My children used to say, Mom's going to be on TV again. I was on many times. I was down in Poughkeepsie, and my sister-in-law called my husband, and she said, I thought I saw your wife on TV. He said, yes, yeah, she's in Poughkeepsie. She's on again. But uh, I, I was a strong belief in my country, and I believe people, if they have a mouth, they should open it and speak their opinion and not say what anyone should do and then expect to be, have things done for you when you don't take an interest in it. So I go to town meetings and various things. but. That's the way I am. Now, you said you have pictures that you want to show? Yes, yes. I brought everything with me so you could see it. But you can understand I loved the Navy. I really loved it. I got so many there. They're all in different parts. That's the little hat. From, these are the medals. Women get medals. <laughs> I was fortunate. Why don't you tell us about that? Now, this is the Waves National hat. We had to have something to bring back our memories of our Navy hats. So we, had, we the girls picked out this and said, this will be our Waves National hat. So we go to the conferences that they have, and we wear our hats, and we wear our white shirts and black ties to have something back from our memory day. And this is uh, uh, Grace Hopper. This is the computer expert. And the government thought she was the best woman of all times who could help them with the computers. She, they didn't let her retire. She just kept working. Very, very important person. And I got that picture from the, uh, when she stood next to me, I'm right behind her at the Waves National Convention. That was good. And these are my medals, believe it or not. I have the American Campaign Medal. Very proud to have a medal. Never expected one. 
They sent me a letter and told me I got that. And this is the American, uh, the uh, uh, World War II Award, the Victory Medal. That's an important thing to have, too. Nice to have. So those, okay, there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that, I think there was a picture, a diagram in there of the Chicago. Those are the pictures of the uh, Nimitz Parade. Uh, they have the well done Admiral. And uh, this is a, a note on the back of this to my mother. Hi, Dolly. Save these for my old age. <laughs> and there's the paper. This is the uh, Capitol Acclaims Nimitz. And uh, that, that was the day of the parade. Well, maybe what we'll do is copy each one of the sure, photographs. Sure, sure. Well, uh, you can keep the photographs if you will, if you think that they will be of any use to the museum. Well, you, you're sure you, you talked to your sons about this? Yes, I did. I told them that I would give up those. That's history. I think it, you know, if you should have it. I didn't want to have some things thrown. Sometimes when people die, uh, they throw everything in a box. And uh, uh, this is from uh, my. Who's that good looking lady? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was my picture after boot training. And uh, this is a picture of the uh, girls, uh, some of the girls that were in the boot training with me. One is from Water Valley now. Uh, she's still around. And then this is Hunter College. I have all these pictures of Hunter College, which is called Lehman College now. And uh, these are very good pictures to keep. And this is the training in the Bronx. They had all sorts of pictures. They show all the, pic the girls that the different things there, show them all marching, believe me. You marched. And is that your And uh, class? this is my class. I have all can you, can you point at, at Hunter College, and I'm right on here. There's a little arrow showing me on there. I tried to put that on. Okay. Hold that flat now. I'm looking at Yeah, where, where? it's over here. I took a little pen. Where did I see? I get my, here it is right here. Okay. Uh, Tired. I've got so much all shoved in there. Hard to see it. They're so small, you know. And that's a paper in there. Uh, uh, these are uh, rather interesting. Uh, we had papers, the bulletin. And in the bulletins, they're very interesting. They have the current events at the time, and then uh, they have all the things, the news for the girls to keep them up on what's going on. One of them, now here the chaplain says, uh, the chaplain would write in here, and then there were bulletins that I had to make all the time. That's the Chicago one. That paper is 60 years old. So you met then Judy Garland yes, yeah, was there, yeah, and Andy they Kander, were all, and they were all there. Everybody that was anybody was there. That's the only way you can say that. And uh, they, uh, I can. Uh, This is the Hotel Bismarck, one of the places there in Chicago, and those are the three girls I'm on this side. Which one are you? I'm, on, I'm uh, on this, the one on the left. Okay. I thought, I thought that was you on the right side. Yeah. But uh, that's the Wave Quarters D. And that was a big station. That had 5,000 waves on it. Now, uh, they have uh, 
I had a picture in here. I think this is the one. Try to get, no, it's, it's the, uh, that's the Havelock paper. That was the Pacific Theater, the whole thing about. Can I hold some of those? Oh, I'm, I'm uh, balancing them well. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's uh, the copy of my discharge. The Navy has to have it a little different. It's a ship. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is my husband and I, uh, our wedding picture. Where did he serve? Uh, he was over to Germany. He was in Ireland for a while. He was in the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, this is the whole picture of the people that were in my wedding. Of course, uh, I'm next to my husband. Mm -hmm. And this was sitting outside uh, the barracks. That was Wave Quarters D. And they had little stairs. You could go outside and sit. And, Okay, and this uh, I brought uh, the girls uh, are women Marines. They had lovely hats. Okay. And these were summer uniforms we had on here. And that's, <laughs> my mother loved this picture. That was, I went to New York and they took a picture. Okay. And let's see, oh, this, this is, uh, I had my brothers that I love so much. So my mother had the, all three of us gone. And uh, let's see, that's, I forget. Oh, this is the boy that had lost his leg. This is the, the young boy on this side had lost his leg, and uh, he was so handsome. Okay. And uh, that girl in the picture, that was the girl that was in my wedding. And this was Chaplain Fallon. And this gives you the idea. That was my wave quarters D, and you can see the parade in the morning at eight o'clock in the morning. That all those women all marching and then coming to see the flag raised. Okay. Okay, I think that was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, it's okay. And we do want a copy. Yeah. Of so. Of these two mm -hmm. put in your file. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Is there, is there any questions? All right, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're rolling. Okay, this is an interview with Vivian Egan, New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York.